Hey everyone, it's Kevin Pang from America's Test Kitchen here. I want to tell you about one of our shows. It's called Proof. Proof dives into the surprising backstories behind the food you love. We'll tell you how pineapples became a symbol of Taiwanese freedom. And consider the ethics of getting your lobster high before eating it. Every episode is filled with dynamic characters and plenty of twists and turns. Check out Proof wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Say More from Boston Globe Opinion. I'm Shirley Liang. These days, it's easy to feel like our country is moving backwards. A conservative Supreme Court has reversed decades of progress on abortion and affirmative action. State and local officials across the country are banning books and censoring sensitive subjects. And white supremacy has seeped out of the political fringe and into the halls of Congress. My guest today has some perspective on all of this. You probably know Drew Gilpin Faust as the former president of Harvard University, the first woman to hold the job. She is also a historian of white supremacy, civil rights, and the antebellum South. But Drew hasn't just studied all of that. She's lived it. She was raised in segregated Virginia, where women and people of color were supposed to stay in their place. In her new memoir, Necessary Trouble, Growing Up at Mid-Century, she writes about escaping this repressive environment and joining the civil rights activism of the 1960s. She marched in Selma, but her parents never knew. I asked Drew how she came to break from the social customs of her upbringing and how her personal history and scholarship inform her view of where the country is headed today. Here's my conversation with Drew Gilpin Faust. Professor Faust, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. So your book is a memoir covering your childhood through the age of 21. And you said this book is about escaping Virginia. So tell me about the Virginia you grew up with and what were you escaping from? I grew up in Virginia in the 1950s and 1960s, and it was a time when the society was segregated and was also a place where women of my family and relatives and friends were all expected to grow up to occupy very constricted social roles. Wives and mothers was really what was the one pathway for a young woman to anticipate. I knew none of my mother's friends who worked and neither did she outside the home. And so I didn't really have role models or people to help me imagine anything beyond what was directly in front of me. And I also was told often by my mother, and these were her very words, this is a man's world, sweetie, and the sooner you figure that out, the better off you'll be. So I chafed at that, and I felt resentful of my three brothers who seemed to have many more freedoms than I did. But I soon recognized that my inequities or the unfairness that I saw about my life was as nothing compared to other unfairnesses around me, which were those of race and seeing the very divided society and limited freedoms for African Americans at that time. So both those issues became central in my understanding of what needed to change and what I needed to change to make my life a livable one. Now, by many standards, I mean, you grew up very privileged, and it seems like you you almost rebelled against this upbringing. You marched in Selma. You joined Students for a Democratic Society, which was an influential left-wing protest movement in the 60s. So to say a little bit more why combating racism was clearly something important to you and how that played out early on in your life. It was important to me that things be fair. And that was important because I was always saying when my brothers were told they could do something and I couldn't, or I had to wear little lace clothes that itched and they didn't have to. And so as I looked around me and saw all the other things that weren't fair in the world, I attached myself to them. And race was a very prominent one among these. My own privilege was something I felt very awkwardly about. And wanted in some ways to disown or move away from, and certainly not to foreground. So it was 
on those questions that I focused my adolescent um, engagement and my movement into student activism as a young person. Race was the most obvious one because of the world I grew up in and also because of the changes that were taking place around me. With Brown v. Board in 1954, we had a mandate in the United States from the Supreme Court to integrate public schools. But in Virginia, where I lived, there was a movement to resist this. And it came from the leadership of the senator from Virginia at that time, Harry Byrd, who lived just down the road from us. I mean, his family was close with my family. Everybody knew everyone else. And he was advocating that Virginia close its schools rather than integrate them. So these questions of race were front and center for me. I heard people talking about them. I heard that the schools in the county next to mine had been closed. So this was a kind of obvious trajectory for me to fix onto that issue as the one that would be of most centrality in my combat against unfairness, which derived from my own sense of what would be the right thing in the world for me as well as for others. Were your parents aware of your activism? I mean, how did they react to that? My earliest example of activism, I suppose, must be my letter that I wrote to President Eisenhower. Right. When, when you were nine, was, right? When nine I was years nine, old? yes. <laughs> and it was in the middle of these controversies about race. It was the year of Little Rock. So I wrote a letter to President Eisenhower saying that segregation was unfair and that I was white and I was nine years old and I had many feelings about segregation. That's how I began it. Didn't tell my parents. And they didn't believe you, right? They didn't believe you sent a letter, right? (laughs) They didn't believe it. And then I got this acknowledgement from the White House and they were taken aback by this. When I got older and went away to school and to college, I had a lot of free reign. My parents didn't always know where I was or what I was doing. And I didn't tell them, not that I was hiding it. It just, I didn't give lengthy reports about what was going on in my life. And that gave me the opportunity to engage in a lot of student activities and student activism, SDS, as you mentioned before, going to Selma without ever telling them. I went to Selma my freshman year of college and they never knew about it. In their Ever? lifetimes. Ever? Never. Oh, wow. My, my mother wow. died not long after that. Right. She died a year, a little more than a year after that. My father died in 2000. I never told him that, wow. that I'd done that. So I recently had Harvard researcher Joan Donovan on this podcast talking about disinformation. And she spends a lot of time on the internet, combing the internet, looking for extremism to understand how it spreads. It reminded me a lot of what you wound up researching on as an academic, studying the history of white supremacy. I mean, many people don't want to know more about white supremacy. You know, it's scary, it's evil. So why did you spend time studying it? My dissertation was about pro-slavery thought, people who defended slavery. And I've written constantly throughout my career about white Southerners before the Civil War. And I was motivated to do that because I've always wanted to understand how people explain to themselves living lives in which they are doing terrible things. And how do you get up in the morning if you are a slave owner and move around your plantation or your farm with unfree laborers who are being treated cruelly and unjustly how do you tell yourself, that's okay, that's just fine? I've always been interested in that because I've been interested in that question for all of us. Growing up in a segregated society, what were the families around me? What were my own parents thinking about that society? And how did they come to accept the inequities that were part and parcel of Virginia in the 1950s? And then I want us to ask today, What are we doing? How are we telling ourselves that we can be um, reconciled to the injustices that we face at this particular moment? I was just last week in Montgomery, Alabama at a meeting convened by Brian Stevenson, a lawyer who has for his, I think, 35 years now, worked on behalf of people uh, unjustly convicted who are mostly on death row. 
he makes the point that incarceration in our time is the outgrowth of earlier racial injustices. And we today accept the cruelties of incarceration, what goes on in the prison system, and the fact that one in three African-American men will spend time in prison during their lifetimes. And so that today is something we need to ask ourselves about. How do we explain that to ourselves? So what's the answer? What, what did you learn? What do people tell themselves? Well, it's somewhat different at all times. There are different ideologies that people draw on to make themselves feel things are okay. In the pre-Civil War era in the South, religion, strangely enough, Christianity was often invoked to justify slavery. And ideologies that persuade people that they are actually being helpful to those they have repressed or dominated. And it's a little scary to see right now in our own society, but when we tell ourselves that slavery wasn't all that bad, that people learned skills during slavery, which is a position being taken in the current Florida Board of Education mandates, that's chilling to me because it's such an echo of how slavery and racial injustice was supported in the past. We pretend that these evils, I just see them as downright evils, are not evils. And instead, we give ourselves a false narrative, both the past and the present, that undermines our ability to look and confront what needs to be changed around us. When you were president of Harvard, you started a very public conversation about how the university needed to explore its ties to slavery. And after you left, Harvard released a massive study detailing, you know, how it benefited from slavery. Why do you think it's important for powerful institutions to come to terms with their past? It's the same reason that it's important for all of us as a nation, um, individuals, institutions, and the nation more generally to acknowledge our past because this past has legacies. It has continuing ties on us in so many ways. What are the buildings named at Harvard? You know, they're named overwhelmingly, well, all of them really, except for a few outposts like the Du Bois Center beginning to change things. But the overwhelming landscape at Harvard is of names of white men. How does it feel as a young person to walk around Harvard and know that nothing is named after someone who looks like you, has had experiences like you. So these kinds of inequities have a, a, a hold on us well beyond the time in which they originally occurred. We need to look at that and say, oh, hadn't thought of that perhaps, need to do something about that. We need to make it visible because until it's visible, it's not gonna be addressed. My conversation with Drew Gilpin Faust continues after this short break. Hi, this is Jim Dow. I'm the editorial page editor at the Boston Globe. Every day, the opinion editors and writers of the Globe bring you columns and editorials on the biggest issues of the moment, from news breaking in our communities to what families across New England are talking about at the kitchen table. In our complex, fast-changing world, rigorous opinion journalism matters more than ever. To sustain this important work, please consider becoming a Globe subscriber Subscribe now at globe.com slash subscribe. That's globe.com slash subscribe. We talked about institutions, colleges, universities, exploring their and, and dealing with what to do with their ties to slavery. And, and once you scratch that surface, I mean, we could you start to see ties to slavery everywhere, right? Here in Boston, the mayor is under pressure to change the name of one of our most famous landmarks. Uh, Faneuil Hall, because its benefactor, Peter Faneuil, uh, made his fortune buying and selling people. And we've seen many statue removals and buildings renamings across the country. Is that what we should be doing? I was asked to ch by um, President Bacow to chair a committee on renaming and what the principles should be for Harvard to use and appeal to when it considered renaming. And the committee was a wonderful experience because it 
had a number of faculty and staff on it who thought deeply about this. And we met on Zoom. It was during the pandemic. And we came up with a set of principles that really rested on the notion that names matter enormously, that we need a greater variety of prominent names across the Harvard campus, that we need to link our understanding, our much broader and deeper understanding of the past to this question of naming, but that names also persist in ways that have uh, powerful emotional links apart from the person they're honoring, and we need to consider that as well. So an important part of this report was process. We are academics and we're all obsessed with process, of course, (laughs) but I think that's true of democracy more broadly. So to ask a question, what does this name mean? How, what was the life experience of the person whose name it is? How central to that person's life was the evil that we are concerned about? How overwhelmingly negative an impact does this name have on those who are using it? So I'm not going to give you an answer to what should happen about Faneuil Hall, but I think a deliberative process to ask, how has it played a role in our society? There is, on the one hand, the slave trading commitments of the man it's named for, and that would suggest real pressure to change. On the other hand, I've just been reading and working on a piece about abolitionists right before the Civil War and about gatherings in Faneuil Hall to uh, incite crowds to demand the release of enslaved people who were captured under the Fugitive Slave Act in the 1850s and were going to be returned to slavery. So Faneuil Hall is in that context a heroic place that had no connection in people's minds really to the founder. So how do we weigh that against the other dimensions? How does it play a role in our society and how should we be thinking about that role and about diversifying names overall, but looking at each one we want to change with the complexity of the life of the person, but also the life of the place or name beyond the person itself? Yeah, I I think the deliberative process is really important. What I worry about is everyone just runs around and changes names and removes statue, but they don't do the real work to create an equal society. It's almost like that statue is gone. We're done here. Let's all move on. When what we really need to do is close the racial wealth gap. We need to uh, end racism. And that's my big concern. People will think, oh, we've solved racism by renaming Faneuil Hall. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, if it's an easy, feel good action with no lasting impact on how we think about these problems and how we live with these problems, then it, it really is a futile act. So in your book, you're very conscious of your whiteness growing up in the South. And as an academic, you're a woman in a male-dominated professional space. And you have said that you were a product of gender-based affirmative action. So how do you feel about the recent Supreme Court decision to end affirmative action in the college admissions process? This case, the part of it against Harvard, was one that was lodged when I was president. So I spent a good deal of time working with our general counsel, with our corporation, our equivalent of the board of trustees, with the dean of admissions, with students, trying to craft our response. I testified in the case here in Boston. I attended the oral arguments in Washington last Halloween day. It was on Halloween. And I have been gutted by the decision. It just hit me, just hit me hard that this was where we were going now as a country and that the decision seemed to deny the realities of race and racism by invoking a kind of colorblindness that never did exist in the United States and certainly doesn't exist now. So it's something that has troubled me a great deal. And it seems part of a larger set of reversals of the, what I would see as the achievements of American society during the time I was growing up. Affirmative action, Voting Rights Act, Roe v. Wade, 
all these things being um, assailed by the courts and then issues like diversity and diversity offices and diversity commitments being challenged as well. And also the challenges to the historiography, the the research in history that was so much a part of, has been so much a part of my professional career, understanding so much better what slavery was, what our national history was, how race played a role in Southern and American history more generally, all of this under attack. So the affirmative action decision was yet one more threat to what has seemed to me the trajectory of progress in American society during my lifetime. Yeah, I'm not worried about Harvard. I think Harvard will figure out how to maintain diversity at a, a very meaningful level, high level. What I really worry about is that people in this country will only read part of the headline. They only read that the Supreme Court has ended affirmative action, period. They won't realize this pertains to college admissions only. I mean, maybe that's coming with future lawsuits, but I'm concerned that, you know, some CEO or, I don't know, some hiring manager will say like, well, diversity doesn't matter. Let's throw it out the window. We're, we're done here, you know, and, and that's my concern. That's a great concern. I appreciate you're saying Harvard will figure it out. I hope you're right. I believe you're right. Let me say this. Other institutions of higher education will be challenged because smaller institutions, colleges, small colleges are going to be less willing to take a risk of being sued and they may overdo what is necessary. And then you raise the issue about the world beyond higher education. And this is not just a thought or an idea or a possibility. Already, there are letters going out from lawyers and members of Congress to private institutions saying, why do you have a DEI office in your corporation? Why are you setting up quotas or in other ways trying to expand the diversity of your employment group? So this is coming. It's not just coming. It's already beginning. It's here. Yes. And it's building on this case and it will move to other cases. So you're absolutely right. This is a decision with ramifications well beyond higher education. So how do we stand our ground if we believe in an equal society? What do we do now? Well, we vote. That's one thing. We are active. We don't give up. And I also think we change the narrative. We try to talk about race in a way that combats the misapprehensions about our past and enables people to understand where we've been, where we are, and where we need to go. And so how do we tell the story of what justice means in our society and and why justice has to include confronting the past and why it matters for an education that your child or your grandchild or you yourself learn in an environment in which people are different from you and why it impoverishes all of us if we see the outcome that has occurred in a number of the states where affirmative action has been banned. That's huge reduction in the presence of African-Americans in the student population. That's bad for everybody. And it's bad for the students who don't have the opportunities that they had before, but it's also bad for the students who are not living in the kind of environment in which the interchanges around difference and from difference can take place. With all the work you've done on on civil rights history and the arc of your life from a young girl in rural Virginia expected to you know conform to gender norms, all the way to being president of Harvard, the first woman president of Harvard. So how are you feeling right now about the direction of the country? I mean, you yourself are like the American dream. But what about right now? I am very worried about the country. I'm worried about the country because so many of what I saw as essential changes that emerged during my life, changes in opportunities for women, for African-Americans, Um, the opening of the country more broadly with the Immigration Act of 1965 so that it is a a country 
open to the world, taking advantage of, of people's talents from all over the world to build a better society. That is being reversed bit by bit. And I find that deeply troubling. And I have at this stage in my life, a certain experience, a certain set of memories that I hope will make people see how dangerous it is to contemplate going back to what the 1950s were like. I want to show how constraining, how restricting it was, not just for those who were directly oppressed, women and African-Americans, but for everyone whose life was distorted by that kind of society. We do not want this, and we should be combating every movement towards it by sustaining the kinds of essential openings that legislation custom made for all of us in in the years since I was a child. So I don't know if I'll be around long enough to see the, what I anticipate as the ultimate victory. I think we have a lot of troubling times to go through, but I just wanted my voice to be one calling for us to beware of what we're losing and to insist on what really matters in America, which is that we be the kind of multiracial democracy that we have been struggling to be, but never yet fully attained. We need to be that and we need to let everyone who has talent express that talent and lead meaningful lives. Thank you, Professor Faust, uh, for joining me here today. Thank you so much for having me. Say More is a production of the Boston Globe. Today's episode was produced by Anna Kusmer, with help from Daniel Ackerman, Scott Hellman, Alexis Sargent, and Abby Kanina. Our editor is Jim Dow. Our engineer is Ariana Martinez. Maggie Taylor is our marketing coordinator. Our music is from APM Music. If you like the show, please follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Find us online at globe.com slash opinion. I'm Shirley Leung. Thanks for listening. Hey there, my name is Nicholas St. Fleur. I'm a science reporter here at STAT and I host our health equity podcast called Color Code. Our second season started airing this spring, and in it, we're taking things local to my hometown of Long Island. Where you live has a huge impact on your health, and Long Island is a microcosm of racial health disparities that exist in suburbs across the country. We've spoken to families and to advocates about how they grapple with issues like environmental racism, segregation, and food deserts. We've heard from scientists and researchers about how redlining of the suburbs continues to create health disparities seen today. And I've explored the ways that racism has impacted my own childhood growing up here. Episodes air every other week through the rest of the summer. Racism in medicine is a national emergency. Together, let's raise the alarm.